Hi, I'm Jeff Colgan, Director of the Climate Solutions Lab uh, here at Brown University, and welcome to this event on Energy's Digital Future, the Colonial Pipeline Cyber Attack and Beyond. Let me say uh, a word about the Climate Solutions Lab before I introduce my guest. So the lab has uh, had a very successful first year. We are just wrapping up the first year, which has seen the development of new courses for students at Brown University and particularly at Watson University, or at Watson Institute uh, for Climate Change. Uh, we've also developed a climate syllabus bank uh, that is housed here at Brown, but is uh, open and available to all instructors worldwide teaching climate change in the social sciences. Uh, and we uh, have launched new research on policy relevant topics. We've also been lucky to host a number of fantastic external speakers, including former Boston Mayor Marty Walsh, now President Biden's uh, Secretary of Labor, uh, and Kelly Gallagher, Academic Dean of the Fletcher School. And we have a, another Fletcher School person uh, here today, uh, and uh, David Victor and Danny Cullen Ward, uh, authors of the, the new book, Making Climate Policy Work. Among others, there, there have been a, a number of really great uh, speakers. So today I am lucky to be joined by uh, Amy Myers Jaffe, who is research professor and managing director of the Climate Policy Lab uh, at the Fletcher School of Tufts University. She was formerly the director of the program on energy security and climate change at the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, and she has taught energy policy, business and sustainability courses at Rice University, University of California, Davis, and Yale University. She is widely published uh, and has a new book that we are going to talk about today called Energy's Digital Future, Harnessing Innovation for American Resilience and National Security, which has to get the top prize for timeliness in terms of uh, a publication date uh, just uh, before uh, the cyber attack on Colonial uh, Pipeline, which of course, Amy uh, was presumably not rooting for in any way, but uh, it is it is um, well positioned that way. The book is published by Columbia University Press uh, in 2021. Uh, and she's also chair of the steering committee of the Women in Energy Initiative at Columbia University's Center on Global Energy Policy. So welcome, Amy. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Jeff. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Uh, likewise. And so today I want to start with uh, the Colonial Pipeline uh, attack and then we'll move to some broader issues, including uh, your book. Uh, so I wonder if, if we could just start by uh, asking you wh what happened on May 7th uh, this, this year? Well, we don't know if it actually, you know, began to happen before May 7th, but on May 7th, the Colonial Pipeline, which is one of the largest pieces of infrastructure, in fact, it was the largest, at the time it was built back in the 60s, it was the largest piece of privately funded infrastructure in the history of the United States. Carries gasoline, jet fuel, diesel fuel, heating oil um, from the Texas refining, from the Texas and Louisiana refining centers, you know, all the way up the Eastern seaboard and a very vital piece of infrastructure. And on the day that you mentioned, um, it was discovered that there was an intrusion into the business side of the operation. So just the, you know, clerical part of the company. And uh, there was, it turned out upon investigation, it turned out to be a ransomware attack. So there was a group and they were asking for payment to give back Colonial Pipeline's data that they had taken down from their computer system, business office computer systems. Right, and you're separating very cleanly there between business operations versus what I assume is sort of pipeline operations that are more kind of physical operations. Is that right? Is that the distinction you're making? That is correct. Now, to refresh the audience's memory, or maybe they weren't aware, uh, back in 2018, I think it was, um, there was a group that hacked into a petrochemical plant in Saudi Arabia. And that was a hack into the safety system, into the computerized safety system of the plant with a much more malicious intent to actually cause an explosion. Um, and so this was distinguished from that as it was characterized as a ransomware attack. So just we're out for money um, where, you know, if you pay us, uh, there'll be no damage to the pipeline. And 
when you talk to cyber experts, uh, what they say is, um, you know, a lot of companies, you know, do pay the ransom and get their data back. Uh, but in the case of a, a very vital infrastructure like this, um, there is this higher risk, even though it's just on the business side of the company, it has been known that some hacks can go, not often, but sometimes go from the business side of an entity to an operational um, system. It's not impossible. And so it was a you know pretty dangerous event in that regard, thinking about what might have happened if this intrusion went beyond um, the business side of that pipeline. Okay, so that begs the question, who launched the attack, right? Nominally, there's this group called DarkSide, but what do we know about the actual attacker? So, you know, none of us are, you know, privy to, you know, the inner world of uh, cyber crime, probably, but dark side is generally said to be in the public domain, a, like a gang, like a criminal gang uh, that is out for money and they try to give it a Robin Hood spin that they're going to take this money and they're going to give some of it, you know, from these rich entities and they're going to give some of it to um, charities, worthwhile charities. And, you know, and, and, and that was, you know, the storyline for Colonial Pipeline. The reason, and, and, and there have been hacks on hospitals and other kinds of vital infrastructure. So, you know, we all have picked up the paper and seen whether our own personal bank was hacked. Um, so what I think distinguished this attack is not necessarily, was it ransomware? Wasn't it ransomware? You know, where, where, where are they rumored to be housed? You know, there's some reports that said, well, they're based in Russia and, you know, how could they do this without, you know, the knowledge of the Russian government, which obviously one would imagine has a good intelligence network that would know what's happening from its territory. But I think really more to the point is the idea that, is it plausible that some group that would go through the exercise of researching well enough to hack into a system. So I'm picking, I'm picking something that I can hack into. I must have done some research about my target and whether they would be able to afford to pay me and how much I could ask for. So it seems a little implausible to me as an analyst who, you know, does, I'm not a cyber expert, but I cover cyber in my book and I talk to other cyber experts who are people who you know spend their whole day every day on cyber uh, it does seem a little implausible that this is perhaps one of the most highly vital pieces of us infrastructure so if you think back to september 11 if you could imagine that you know the us government had certain infrastructure that was physically protected. You know, there was some patrols over that infrastructure or you would use some kind of electronic means to make sure that you understood whether there was um, any kind of uh, infiltration of the boundaries of the land where that infrastructure is. Colonial Pipeline would have been at the very top of a list. And so it's very hard for me to believe that there's some hapless criminal gang that, you know, accidentally, I mean, it's possible, but it seems a little implausible that there's some hapless criminal gang that just happened to pick a vital piece of infrastructure, energy infrastructure. Now, the interesting part of the story, like if we were all writing a spy novel, is that, uh, I don't remember exactly what year, but, you know, within the last couple of years, there was a criminal gang in Russia that infiltrated a pipeline system and somehow supposedly accidentally put very contaminating um, material. So like a, a, a chemical that is normally taken out of a crude to make it because you can't, it's dangerous to people and it's dangerous to equipment. So normally it's, it's, it's cleaned out of oil before it's transmitted. So if you're a Russian producer, you would clean that out of the oil before you would um, pipe it on to Europe. 
um, giant contamination, shut down the Russian pipe, the Struzba pipeline uh, to Europe from Russia for months, um, cost the Russian government billions and billions of dollars in cleanup costs. And the oil, the contaminated oil had to be stored on ships and then like slowly fed a little bit at a time back into the pipeline system so that the contamination would be just diluted, 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 diluted. And so when all the news reports were happening and one could kind of imagine, um, you could imagine the US president calling President Putin and saying, hey, you know, we'd like an explanation of how this happened on your territory. The Russian ambassador to the EU went on uh, PBS on Armanpour, the television show Armanpour, and specifically said that the United States and Russia should you know, work at the UN to try to eliminate um, these <coughs> criminal activities. And he referenced the fact that Russia's own pipeline system had been attacked by a criminal gang. This does, uh, I mean, you referenced the sort of spy novel. This does start to sound like, you know, James Bond and the whole bit, right? I mean, like- And, and let me remind you, there is a James Bond movie where James Bond, you know, pipelines clean themselves by having something called a pig, which is a robotic device that goes along the pipeline and cleans right. it when it's empty. And there is a scene, I forget which movie it was, where James Bond literally rides in a pipe in one of these pigs through one of these pipelines in Azerbaijan. And I, I remember everybody that I went to the movie with um, who knows a lot about oil and gas, we like couldn't believe it, <laughs> right? That there was like an oil and gas stunt theme in a James Bond movie. So not the first time somebody's imagined that. Right. So one of the political implications of having private companies like Colonial in charge of what amounts to critical infrastructure for the United States? Well, traditionally, it hasn't been a problem. But as I talk about in my book, as we go to digital systems, so one of the things that Colonial had innovated to save money and to be more, more optimized was they had gone to a system where, you know, people don't think about it, but you know, when you go to the gasoline station, there are different grades of gasoline. And then you think about it, um, you know, the air quality standards for Atlanta are different than the air quality standards for some other place along the pipeline. And how does Colonial manage that? So they do what's called batching. Um, and so if you imagine that I have this giant pipeline system and I have people, you know, manually writing tickets to make a delivery of, of some kind of oil along the system to some distributor along the system, you can imagine the benefit that would come if you could program that by computer and use sensors to know that you're delivering 100 gallons over here, and then the computer would say, okay, we're at 99.9 .9 gallons, I'm gonna stop in 15 seconds, right? And, and to really you know, use more automation. And then of course, there would be a benefit to then attaching that automation to a billing system. So I know exactly how much was delivered and then somehow it feeds into some data, big data, and then somehow somebody somewhere in the business office can, you know, utilize that data. And, you know, the trick in all of this, and that could be, you know, equipment we're going to use to make sure that water when we're drilling doesn't, doesn't um, leave the well bore. It could be sensors that are used to make sure there's no methane um, leakage along a pipeline or in, uh, in a, an operation. It could be some other kind of company using it to make sure that there are no harmful emissions coming from their manufacturing plant. I mean, there's all kinds of things we're gonna supposedly do with sensors, including 3D printing, right? And the challenge is, these are all amazing um, technologies and they can actually promote the environment. They can make us much less greenhouse gas uh, uh, intensive, but it raises the surface area, right? So, you know, Colonial was very clear that they have a strict firewall 
you know, so between you by surface area, because I think that's a term that I think is is worth kind of unpacking a little bit. Well, you know, surface area. So let me give you an example from your own home, because I know a lot of people listening. You know, this might be their like first time experience in thinking about vital energy infrastructure. Yeah. So if you think about, you know, it's the summer. There's a giant thunderstorm. The electricity in your house goes out. Okay. So back when I was a little girl, um, if that happened at night, you know, my mother had these giant candles uh, over the refrigerator and we would have a fun evening with the candles doing puppet shows, you know, hand puppet shows and doing all kinds of fun things because we couldn't watch television. Right. Of course, I don't want to date myself, but you know, we only had like three or four television stations in those days. So maybe it wasn't such a big loss. And we still played board games in those days. So you could play a board game by candlelight. But when that happens today, the inconvenience level is much greater if you're very digitized. If you had all your home systems connected to Alexa, that means that everything's going down, right? If you have electronic banking, guess what? Can't use your bank account. If you were buying everything from e-commerce, from Amazon and Instacart and you know those different services, now all of a sudden you have no electricity, you cannot order any food or goods that way. And if the electricity was out for your whole area and you didn't happen to have any cash, you wouldn't be able to go use Apple Pay or swipe your, your credit card, right? Because that also requires electricity. So that's what I mean when I say the surface area of things that would change that you couldn't do without electricity or without the internet or so forth, you know, becomes larger. And when you imagine that larger space that's affected by, say, a blackout, that is the space in which a hacker could come in and hassle you. Right. right? Because they could come in through your electronic bank account, they could come in through your Netflix account, they could come in through your burglar alarm system, they could come in through Alexa, right? So if you think about all the different gadgets you have in your house, your laptop, if you think about all the different gadgets you have in your house and now you're connecting them all together, like my music system, I want the air conditioning to go up slightly so I push a button instead of going and turning on the thermostat, all these things that you connect to your Alexa makes them all hackable at once. So that's what I mean when I say expanded surface space. So you can imagine times a giant business like an oil pipeline or some kind of vital infrastructure. Um, the more you digitize, then the, the more you have to protect. That would be the best way to put it. The more you digitize, the more you have to protect. So it's not just uh, the, the range of things that you depend upon uh, digitally, but also the, all the different portals, the ways in that a, that a hacker can get into. Right? And, and, and for Colonial, you know, one of the interesting questions, uh, which really you know, it bring, it brings up an important point is, could I do that thing manually? So for example, if I was afraid I see a bad storm coming uh, where I live, I might go to the bank and get some cash because that way, if I needed food, you know, I could use my cash <laughs> to get food and I wouldn't have to worry about whether or not my Apple Pay is working, right? So, um, so it's kind of the same thing with, you know, vital energy infrastructure, like, can I operate it manually? That was a big question for Colonial. Were they going to be able to go back and go use a manual system to make these deliveries, right? And then the second question um, is, and, and, and I don't want to make an assumption here, but well-run companies that understand how important their infrastructure is, you know, to the nation and to their customers should have a cyber plan. So, you know, obviously, you know, prevention, 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 but, um, but, you know, what do you do on the moment in time when you find out that you're, prevention systems fail. The question is, when you call the chairman to tell him that, yeah. do you already know what you're gonna do? Have you already thought through what you would do exactly? And it's not clear from how they behaved and the cutoffs that happened that Colonial had a plan in place or had a good plan in place. 
So one of the criticisms that I've heard of Colonial is that they didn't have a backup, right? Like a completely separate offsite backup where they could just say, okay, you've got our data, but we've still got it too. We just have to sort of reload it or whatever, right? That, that, and so that's the striking part of this. And, and I've heard a story, I, I won't say which company it was, uh, but I've heard a story about another company, a European company, where they had a similar ransomware attack where all their data was you know, t taken and blackmail was happening. And it was across, you know, an international locations, right? Because remember, sometimes you have a company and you're in more than one place. And it turned out that someone in the company had broken their computer and had the computer was like in a separate place, unplugged, being upgraded. And it had all the data on it. Right. And they were able to tell these ransomware criminal gang you know, no, we're not paying you. And, and then that became like an understanding of best practice. Like, it's not even like, should you have it on a thumb drive? Like, you should have multiple computers somewhere, you know, that you know, you could turn on that are disconnected from your network, right. and are not going to connect into your network, and are not connected to the internet, that you could turn on that have your data. Right, and this this I think brings up a, a key point of that. It's not just about you know really clever hackers sitting at their keyboards. It's also there's a human dimension to this. That very often there is an internal component where you know there's somebody on the inside who's helping them out. Yeah, that can, uh, and, that can happen. I mean, there, I, I I'll tell you, I won't say which country it was, but there was a case of a country where they were hacked in vital industry, and it came about because somebody came in who had access and stuck in the thumb drive. And that's how the virus got into their system was through with like somebody bringing in a thumb drive. And that's why many of you who are probably listening to the, uh, our talk today thought, well, geez, my company's crazy. They won't let me use my own thumb drive. Well, guess what? That's why, because it's, you know, hard to police. It's as hard to police as saying, don't click the link on that email. We're never going to email you your paycheck, you know, in a phishing right. attack, you know what I mean? So I want to come back to the politics of this, though, because I mean, I'm trying to think about this from from you know, Joe Biden's perspective. When you start to see, you know, lineups at gasoline stations uh, in, you know, pre predominantly the southeast, right, in, in Georgia and in North Carolina, other seats, it, it can't help but invite comparisons to 1973, uh, which was fortunately, you know, before my time, but uh, so it was a long time ago, but it was, it was, it's not that long ago that people don't know that that was the sort of legacy of, um, you know, an energy crisis, which very quickly became a political crisis. Uh, okay, so let's, let's so talk let's about, about first. okay, so let's think about why it wasn't like 1973, okay. with all, with all due respect to the president's critics. In 1973, there was actually the possibility that there wouldn't be enough oil to meet global demand. Um, and that was partly because you had some countries that were hoarding and that made it worse. But, um, but in this case, you had two things at work. First of all, you're talking about a pipeline. The gasoline was there. It was sitting in tanks. We weren't short of oil. There was actually high inventory of gasoline in the United States. It's ahead of the Memorial Day weekend. So the Biden administration, you know, lifted some restrictions and did some things to try to ease the logistical bottleneck, but you're going to be able to move that gasoline by, by ship from the Gulf Coast by ship. You are going to be able to have gasoline shipped in from Europe, right? You are going to be able to have gasoline moved around the country by truck. So there was actually no shortage. What happened was, uh, and I know everybody responded negatively to the Secretary of Energy's toilet paper analogy, but really what happens is most Americans drive around on half a tank. That's the statistic. Those of us who do oil demand, you know, statistics, you know, that's like a basic rule of thumb. So if everybody in Georgia, in a particular region, like it doesn't have to be only Georgia, like just say everybody in Atlanta freaks out because they saw one gasoline station run out. And so, you know, 500,000 people run out to go from half a tank to a full tank. That's doubling normal demand for the stations in that area. So you're going to have 
it run out faster than it normally would and deliveries are going to be a problem to keep up because you're doubling demand in one day in 24 hours okay but we were never in a 1973 situation because the oil was there and no one could blackmail us about the oil it was just we're going to have to move it around differently so if somebody turned off the colonial pipeline forever or for a month it, it, it all that would happen is we'd have to truck gasoline around for a period of time until we moved it you know through different pipelines and you know re reassess the system and moved it in other ways by ship hmm. so we were never in that kind of a 73 style crisis situation but you could imagine now and, the, and and i went on tv and maybe some of you saw me and i said listen this is a sputnik moment so what do i mean by that i did not mean that the president should be embarrassed it's it's like 73 no no because logistically it wasn't even close right we're talking about our own gasoline in our own country you know we just had a logistics problem what i meant was we can now understand maybe a little bit more uh, attunely how important cybersecurity is for vital energy infrastructure. And we have not focused on it well enough. And by Sputnik moment, what do I mean by that? Well, you know, that was the moment in time when we realized that uh, the USSR was ahead of us in getting satellites into space. If you could imagine in your own mind what our life would be like today if the president at the time had said, you know what, we have a lot of people who are poor at home and we have a lot of things we have to do that are high priority at home. We cannot afford to go to space. We're not gonna have satellites. We're not gonna try. We're not spending money on that. Imagine if the Soviet Union had superior satellite technology and everything that went with it and we were 20 years behind or 30 years behind I don't think we'd have a democracy now. We would have been a great national risk. And, you know, some of the things we did to respond to that moment in time and space, I think a lot of people don't know this. I go into it in the book. Um, the reason you have GPS, Jeff, is that the US scientists who work for the government had to develop a system to track the Sputnik satellite to make sure we knew where it was and that nothing ominous was going to happen. And that's why we developed GPS. Now everybody has it on their phone. Right. Like none of us would have that on our phone, you know, but for the Sputnik moment. So when I say Sputnik moment now, in the, in the future world, geopolitics of energy, when we're gonna go to electricity being the major carrier of energy, and what do I mean by that? Right now about 20% of things we do, whether that's driving, heating, lighting, you know, watching Netflix, you know, that's about 20% of the energy we use comes in the form of electricity. If we're gonna go down net zero, even if we don't make it to net zero, we're gonna go down to decarbonization, which seems pretty clear to be the trajectory now. Um, the projections are that 50% of the energy used globally and certainly in the United States is gonna be electrified. So, that means that I need to make sure if I'm talking about national defense, I'm talking about our US military bases, I'm talking about protection of our citizens, I'm talking about protecting our vital infrastructure, our banking system, everything. I have to ensure that the United States has superior cyber defense. And guess what? You know, the best defense is an offense. Like, I need to make the consequence of a cyber attack on the United States so painful for the perpetrator of that attack, because if I were to counterattack with a cyber attack of my own, it could be even more devastating to the other party. So I need to be gearing up. Well, right. before we talk about retaliation, I'm curious about the, I mean, just the sort of the regulation side of this, right? Because coming back to this idea of a, you know, a private company in charge of a huge part of our infrastructure. And they're not, as, as I understand it, they're not heavily regulated in yeah. terms of what they need to do for cybersecurity. Well, I, you know, and I, I made this statement that we're finding out this is a little bit like the Macondo accident where you're like, you thought everything was on track and we had all these rules 
and then you find out that the industry actually spent all their money on prevention and they the didn't condo, actually... the, the condo accident is the deep water horizon, you know, Explosion. BP's hill. Right, yes. in, in the yeah. Gulf. Well, well, we watched in horror for two weeks because the industry didn't have a way to plug the hole. Right. Right. So, so I feel this is a little bit like the same thing. The industry has had a pretty good record, right, of protecting infrastructure. Right. And, and they had this whole, you know, selling point, it should be voluntary, which, you know, now when we look back on it, like, you know, who agreed to that, right? So, and, and that might've worked in the past because the threats were not as large, right. but that's why I say Sputnik moment. At this moment in time, knowing what we know, this colonial pipeline thing was a blessing sure. because now we understand where we need to go. We need to be spending much more money on this the companies, unfortunately, do need to be regulated. Maybe there need to be standards, right? Um, you know, it's been an uneasy uh, collaboration because the government itself gets hacked. And so, like, you're telling me you want me to share with you all my <laughs> proprietary information about how I'm protecting my infrastructure. Like, hell no, because I saw you got hacked, right? right. But that's different than having there be an evaluation where uh, I'm coming to you, you know, secretly perhaps, and saying, you know, uh, the uh, Homeland Security Department determined that you're a class one infrastructure, and therefore we want to see your contingency plan, and you are required to do the following eight things. Um, that seems like something we should be doing. So I, I want to just. And it shouldn't be voluntary. Right. Right, it shouldn't be voluntary, uh, and that of and, course. And is honestly, no offense to that agency, I don't think it should be the TCA, T TSA. TSA. Mm. Right, I, I think it should be either its own agency. You know, the chairman of IBM made the suggestion that we had, should have something like NASA, but only for cyber, mm -hmm. um, because it requires a certain, um, you know, brilliant kind of uh, 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 agency that's science based and highly uh, technical. Um, so I, I don't know what the thing is. Some people say that part of the problem today is there's so many committees in the Congress and so many agencies in the US government that have some minor mandate in this area that we really need to just, you know, come into a more focused approach. Good. Well, so I want to come back to this idea that the CEO of, of uh, Colonial, when they paid the ransom, uh, ultimately said, you know, this was the right decision for the country, right? He made it, of course, a, a sort of, you know, patriotic move. And I, I want to ask you, you know, what are you hearing from cybersecurity experts on, you know, whether they did the right thing by paying the ransom? So I've been, you know, appeared with and, and talked to some top cybersecurity experts, including Susan Landau, who works with me at the Fletcher School. And they all say universally, you should never pay the ransom, right? And that's because you, you, you know, it subjects more and more people to attacks because it's right. profitable, right? Right. So I, I'll tell you what I think- It's all about the precedent, really. Right, right. But you know, in that context, right? The question is if, let's just say the president you know, had the capability or the skill or the secretary of state uh, or our ambassador in, you know, different countries had the skills to address this diplomatically to have this gang collected up. Or maybe it's not possible, but you would imagine that you would want the US government to try to do some diplomacy um, if it was something that was of, of such great importance and when a company steps out and you know takes an independent action, um, you know, I, I don't think that I'm not saying there was diplomacy this time, yes or no. I'm I'm not you know uh, a privy to that. But what I would say is when companies make independent actions, um, they have national security consequences. Um, and so you know, with all due respect to the chairman of Colonial, is he saying that based on something the rest of us don't know? Or he's saying that because he found it sounded good as a soundbite, right? And and I, I don't know the answer to that question, but um, for sure he shouldn't just wing it out there and say as a patriot he paid this ransom because you know we don't pay ransom, the U.S. government doesn't pay ransom, we don't pay ransom. Well, Cyber so experts say don't pay ransom. 
that is a, a great point, right? That you know the U.S. government famously doesn't negotiate with terrorists, right? That's the, the the Hollywood line on this, and and yet we get into this kind of interesting world where there are these kind of uh, public-private borders where you know Colonial is a, a, a private company, uh, oh. it's a privately owned company, uh, and yet it's it's doing something that is right on in the public sphere and has national security uh, implications. And so, so that then so, so, the, so going back to my spy novel, yeah. I, I feel I must make this point. So going back to my spy novel, um, and this was sort of tweeted on my, my Twitter feed because you know obviously I'm like talking about Colonial and looking at myself in the mirror on Twitter, right? What did I say? What did somebody else say? And um, somebody tweets at me uh, this news report that the cryptocurrency account of Darkside has been drained mm. and that their website and every URL associated with them has disappeared off the face of the internet. And that caused this whole swirling on social media about whether or not they got frightened and took themselves silent whether they just thought, oh, we're getting too much heat, we're just gonna make ourselves silent for 10 minutes and we're gonna turn back up, or whether or not, as one person put it on Twitter, question mark, central command or no, question mark, right? So, you know, again, who knows, right? But um, any, uh, I can say one uh, story um, that was published in the New York Times. So I feel like it's been in the Times. I can't, you know, say I verified it, but, you know, I feel like the Times was well plugged in. The reporter who did it is a, a very, I admire their work. So you might recall back in 2019, we're having a, an escalation in the conflict between Iran um, and other regional allies of the United States. And there was massive amount of attacks on ships going in and out of the Persian Gulf. And it was becoming a bigger and bigger embarrassment um, for President Trump and he was under some, tr uh, some pressure. And you know the Iranians, everybody was saying, oh, this is what you get for dropping out of the nuclear deal. And so you might remember that the Japanese prime minister went to Iran and to embarrass him while he was in Iran, uh, a Japanese tanker was attacked in the Persian Gulf. And you know it was escalating to the point where like we, you asked me, you know, is this problem with colonial, did that embarrass President Biden politically, right? So this is how President Trump handled it, um, which as reported by the New York Times, uh, suddenly the Iranians were not attacking shipping anymore. And uh, the New York Times reported that the United States military temporarily turned off the GPS of of the, I don't know whether it was the, I don't remember, it was the Iranian Guard or the Iranian Navy or both, but basically the Iranian military lost its shipping GPS in the Persian Gulf for some period of time, right? And, you know, maybe five years from now, we're all going to hear, you know, that maybe we did something, maybe we didn't, I don't know. But um, that's the funny thing about cyber is that sometimes, the action you would take um, might not be something that is ever going to be shared with the public um, because it goes to what they call that methods and whatever. I, I never remember what that term is. Um, but attribution. Attribution. So, but I tell you that story that was in the New York Times about Iranian shipping because, you know, it's a material thing. Um, if, it's, if that Times report was true, uh, you know, that was a very effective way of stopping the attacks on the ships because they did stop the attacks on the ships. Interesting. Well, listen, I want to uh, make sure that we talk about your book. And of course, your book is, is uh, energy, uh, Energy's Digital Future, which includes cybersecurity, but lots of other things as well. So tell us a little bit about sort of the, the, the core themes of your book. So one of the big core themes of the book is that we're coming up with these new technologies. I call them digital. Some people might you know, take umbrage with that. but they have energy implications. So are we going to go to self-driving vehicles? And would that be fuel saving or would that be fuel increasing? So one of the things we know as academics pre-COVID was that Uber um, and Lyft and the ride hailing companies could be very energy saving. Um, but in fact, 
people felt that they, oh, look, I'm, I'm doing my climate citizenry because I don't own a car, but then they're driving around as an individual with another driver who's driving around all day looking for a pickup. And so, um, and so that actually turned out that people were taking less public transportation, using much more gasoline, causing much more air pollution, much more congestion, right? So I write about, and the state of California just did this last week, how we need to regulate some of these new technologies. If we're going to have self-driving robo taxis in major cities, they need to be, you know, clean vehicles and they need to be regulated clean. And um, same thing with a lot of other technologies, e-commerce -E and trucks be incredibly efficient and actually eliminate emissions and fuel use. The first year that um, UPS put in place an algorithm to do your package planning um, by computer with big data. Um, it, they saved 100 million miles of vehicle miles travel in the United States in one year alone. So GE and some of the other companies have made estimates that whether it's an airline using the program, whether it's a, a trucking company, we're talking about a, maybe a 25% gain in efficiency and less energy needed. Um, and when you multiply that across, think about 3D printing, you know, we now 3D print engines, you know, air, uh, jet engines. Uh, so instead of having, you know, thousands of parts in this engine, which are being manufactured all around the world and shipped in a ship that uses oil, I'm 3D printing it in one place um, and having many fewer parts. So again, less emissions, uh, less oil use. So those things have, <coughs> have two different implications. One is good for the climate if we do it on purpose and regulate it to make it do it on purpose, instead of having it maybe take us in the opposite direction of raising emissions. Um, but the second implication is, if it does help us peak oil use, you know, what are the geopolitical implications of that? Who loses? What happens? What happens if you're a country that's highly dependent on oil revenue? Um, what happens if you're an investor and you were owning a stock of a certain company I won't mention on a podcast, right? Uh, you know, that stock is going to go down and that was your, you were going to retire, you know, based on that income. So a lot of implications, which I go through in the book. So part of the fun of the book is I tell you some of the inventions that we're going to all be using that are digitized and how we might use them and why we need to think about their climate footprint. Um, but then I also have a very geopolitical part of the book that explains, you know, what will these things mean in the future? You know, powerful countries are going to be the countries that are most capable in cyber. And, um, and who are those countries going to be? I have a whole chapter on the fact that China is full steam, committed to these technologies, and even trying to steal some of those technologies from American companies. So, you know, we need to like get organized here like, as I said, Sputnik moment, right? And thinking about, you know, what kind of industrial policy, infrastructure policy do we need? And how does the future digitization of all these aspects of our lives, whether it's manufacturing, household activities, and so forth, you know, what is the national security implications of all that? And how do we prepare? Well, so, so many great uh, things in there, but let me pick up on, on one thread of this. I mean, one of the questions there is sort of, if we are seeing peak oil demand, you know, which countries are gonna suffer, which investors are gonna suffer. Uh, and of course, one thing that, that Amy, I know knows well, is that the, the low cost oil in the world is mostly in the Persian Gulf, right? That's where the cheapest oil is. And so if we're thinking about, you know, lower oil demand around the world, the, the companies that are gonna hurt first are typically in the, the developed world, uh, right? In the, in, and I say developed, but it, in the sort of, you know, North America and, and Europe. Well, uh, yes, and, 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 and we've okay. already seen some of that in terms of markets. I mean, we've seen uh, all the big oil companies with its one exception have pulled out of the oil sands in Canada, which is a very expensive place uh, to produce oil and with a big carbon footprint. Right. Um, the Arctic, you know, uh, could be a big disadvantage for Russia. They could have this double whammy where people don't want to invest in the Arctic because it's too expensive. But then on top of that, you have the permafrost melting, which makes their existing infrastructure in the Arctic 
uh, under the threat of collapse, right? If the ground underneath the pipeline or the ground underneath the gas processing plant uh, is soft and no longer hard, you know, what so is that President, mean? President Biden just made this decision about allowing um, continued operations by, I think it's Occidental, uh, that in, in Alaska. And so that's sort of this remarkable, even though there's been a big well, you know, climate well, twist and here's, by Biden. Here, and here's the remarkable thing about it is companies operating in Alaska, I don't think it was Occidental, but companies operating in Alaska literally need to use chemical equipment to keep the ground frozen, right? right? And so, um, so it's not an easy task. And I think the challenge the president has, honestly, and people are asking about this, so you know, let me put it out there. You know, when you're president, you're president of everyone. And I got it. I mean, I work for the Climate Policy Lab. I'm dedicating my time towards you know decarbonization pathways and helping my own government and other governments you know get there fast. But you still have to consider, you know, how are you going to have a just transition geographically? And, you know, Alaska has a lot of problems because they not only have um, this declining interest in oil and gas from Alaska, which is going to accelerate over time because it's expensive, it's distant, you know, but they also have the higher budgetary pressure of how are they gonna help their own citizens who are under pressure because there's some community that's you know, sinking into the sea or you have uh, traditional communities that used ice huts to sustain food in the winter. And now that might not be possible, right? Or you're gonna have a change in patterns for ecological services and, and, and the migration patterns of animals, right? So Alaska has, deep sustainability problems. And I would find it difficult to be the president of the United States and think about what is the best path forward to help Alaska. Because if you look at it just like, no, we have to shut all the oil and gas production off. Um, okay, but then what are we gonna do for the state of Alaska? How are we gonna pay for these other emergencies? And I, you know, one has to think about how do I implement that? Can I implement that today? Can I implement that next week? Can I implement that in a year? Like how long is it gonna take me to get prepared to have Alaska's budget um, be able to cope with turning off the oil and gas? I think you're asking the right questions, but of course that plays out in New Mexico and Wyoming and Louisiana. And, you know, it's not just Alaska for, for the United States. Like, so uh, th then it becomes, you know, it, it would be one thing if we were covering it out just for one state, but this is a, a question for the whole union. It, it is a question for the whole union. And, and I think that one really needs to think about real solutions, right? So listen, you know, I know a lot of people in Houston who have moved to the offshore wind industry who used to work in the offshore oil industry. And indeed, the main association that used to be the Association of Professionals in Offshore Drilling is now the Association of Professionals in Offshore Drilling and Offshore Wind, literally. Great. Right? Progress. So we're, we're definitely transitioning. <laughs> um, uh, but you know, what is that expression? Rome wasn't built in a day. And so, um, and so you do get this problem and we saw, we've seen it in energy policy, even as far back as 2007, when things weren't as polarized, um, you know, there's winners and losers. And, you know, one of the real lessons of diplomacy is that if your victory comes at such a huge I mean, why do we do the Marshall Plan after World War II? If your victory is comes at such a huge cost to the vanquished that um, it's not possible to have a peaceful coexistence, that's not going to be successful, right? So we, we need to come up with a transition that includes all Americans. And I think the president is, has made that clear as his intention. 
And therefore, but he's also put down a marker that we're having an energy transition and he's committed to net zero. Um, and so, you know, cut him a little slack. It's been how many days? <laughs> You know, he's not going to come up with a plan for Alaska, Texas, New Mexico, and what have you in, you know, 50 days. I mean, it's going to take some thoughtful participation. And to the extent, and I say this as a person who lived in Texas for a lot of my life, you know, when you have politicians, when, you when you're four minutes and 37 seconds away from having the entire state of Texas's electricity grid collapse, which would have meant that the problem would have lasted weeks longer. And you say that, oh, it's because a windmill froze. I mean, that means you know nothing about, well, you're being political, but you know, do you really believe anything about electricity? Because could you believe that there's no reserve power to handle a bunch of windmills, right? If natural gas is such a resilient <clears throat> fuel and it's the great backup, you know, Natural gas is important because it's, it's the backup for renewables because renewables are so intermittent. You know, if that's true, and it wasn't the natural gas that failed, then how come the natural gas wasn't there to back up that frozen windmill? I mean, well, of course, surprised. we know they did fail, right? Natural right. gas did fail. Right, right. right. So, so my so point to you is we, we get in these discussions where we just say any nonsense and, you know, the president needs to actually come up with a plan that's gonna work for all Americans. That's right. Knowing that he's committed to decarbonize. And, and so while we're on that topic of, sort of, of the Texas uh, uh, winter storm that you're referring to, uh, I wanna, you know, one of the, the claims that was sort of bandied about is that, you know, renewables were more vulnerable uh, to cyber attacks as well as weather events uh, than fossil fuels. And so I'm interested in this question about relative vulnerability between well, well, listen, renewables and others. Let's just remember that Colonial Pipeline, a oil infrastructure was hacked, okay? So, and that's kind of part of the point of my book is that, you know, as we digitize everything, the distinction between one kind of thing and another kind of thing really goes away, mm -hmm. right? But I always try to remind Americans um, because, you know, we, you, you turn on the light switch and you, you, no one knows. If you ask the average person on the street, like we did a Jay Leno, you know, thing on the street in Providence. And we said, you know, when you turn on the light switch, where does that electricity come from? I mean, how many people could really answer that question? Not too many, right? So the point is, when you get up in the middle of a hurricane, like Hurricane Sandy, you can't get gasoline because A, it takes electricity to pump that gasoline at your retail station, but guess what? You need electricity to run what we call the wholesale rack. You know, and many of you have probably seen when you're driving on the highway or down a, a, a local road, you see one of those terminals with the big tank trucks to bring the gasoline as sitting underneath something that's pouring the gasoline into the tank part of the truck. That all requires electricity. So one of the experiences during Hurricane Sandy was getting all the electricity back together for every single gasoline station and every single wholesale rack. That's a big job. Getting the electricity back to your house to be able to generate enough electricity to charge your car, that's easier. Getting the electricity back to a particular stretch of highway that has charging stations, fast chargers, is. I, my opinion, easier than getting electricity to the entire gasoline system, right? So during Hurricane Sandy, indeed, there were some towns that restored their electricity relatively quickly and people would drive to those towns and charge their car. Sure. And they were the only ones who could drive because you couldn't get gasoline. Taxi cabs couldn't get gasoline. So if you were an electric car post Hurricane Sandy, you were still driving. So I think it, you know, it depends, right? The question is depends, but renewable energy tends to be geographically dispersed. The gasoline system is highly centralized on the US Gulf Coast. And of course we all know how many hurricanes can throw off gasoline because we've all sat in horror when a hurricane knocked out gasoline and now all of a sudden it's a national problem, just a hurricane, right? So, 
one of the things we can do in electricity, there's a lot of things we can do in electricity. We can have backup power. So what do I mean by that? We can have more generation capacity than we need so that when there's something goes wrong in one place, we can power up 20% more capacity in a different plant and then wheel the electricity around. We can, we can have a storage device. Um, you know, batteries now or in, industrial sized batteries now are coming up to be an increasing solution, at least for temporary outage, right? Someday soon in New England, maybe we're going to have offshore wind that's going to produce hydrogen and you could store the hydrogen and put it in a fuel cell to generate electricity after electricity was as a backup, right? So we're going to have more and more technologies. Um, and again, talk about it in the book where it's going to be harder actually to permanently turn off electricity if we do things correctly. And the if we do things correctly part, you know, lesson of Texas is the if we do things correctly. You know, my colleague and your colleague at Rice, Ken Metlock, a professor of economics, sure. I recently heard on a podcast, great podcast, where he said that if Texas would actually develop its full solar and wind potential and then connect by transmission wire to other states around it, it could provide much more resilience to the entire Southwest electricity system um, than, than any of the states around there currently have. Of course, but it's a big political decision that Texas wants to be isolated largely from right. the rest of the US grid. Uh, Correct. You know, and yeah, so fascinating. Listen, I'm keeping an eye on time and I know we're, we're um, uh, running out of time, I don't want to leave without asking you about recently we had a big day for for oil where three different oil companies kind of faced a, a significant uh, uh, moment all uh, at, at once. And I just want to ask you for your uh, take about it. So let me just say, you know, very quickly what they were, right? So Exxon uh, had a, a battle over its board of directors where uh, a, an environmentalist group got some um, kind of climate savvy uh, directors uh, uh, on the board uh, against the management's uh, desires. Shell lost a court case in the Netherlands and the court case uh, de demands that they reduce their uh, carbon emissions, including what's called scope three carbon emissions, which includes their customers. Uh, and then Chevron was also, um, uh, there was a shareholder action, a vote uh, to compel, uh, not compel, to advise the, the, the company to um, take uh, its emissions goals more seriously. So what's, I mean, that's a lot in one day. So, you know, tell me what, what's your take on that kind of shock uh, to Big Oil? You know, I think that the companies have failed to understand the amount of time they have to make changes. So the companies are making changes because BP's announcements were much more um, dramatic than some of the other companies. Uh, the companies you mentioned, at least in the case of Exxon and Chevron, have been sort of tinkering at the edges. Yeah. And, um, you know, Shell has a, a more comprehensive approach, but the court ruled that that approach, even though it's ambitious, was not, it was out of alignment with the ambition that has, uh, uh, is the ambition of the state that hosts, the country that hosts it, right? And, and, and it's not in line with the EU. And when you hear oil companies say that they're signing a pledge to end methane leakage and, and routine flaring and venting by 2030, you're like, I don't understand. You have the technology to do it now. It's the law in Colorado. Like what's gonna take till 2030, right? Right. So I think there's a bit of a tin air effect, right? Where I'm not understanding how, and you know, for years, the oil companies did not consider us their customers because we didn't have any place else to go. You want to use your car, you're stuck, right? But we all have a choice now. And I write about this in my book. Um, you know, OPEC gets crazy and makes the price of oil too high. We're all going to buy electric cars, right? Energy companies don't want to decarbonize. We can decarbonize for them by buying electric cars, right? Or, you know, living, you know, as a lot of people are starting to do, you know, living locally, right? Now that we're all telecommuting, or not all, but a lot, a lot of people have the option now to telecommute, it's much easier to live locally and put your, your, your home where you could walk to the store, or do other things in, in a walking way. Um, so, so I do think that 
but companies are not understanding the pace at which they need to change. And this last week was like a rude awakening, I think, for a lot of these managements that this slow pace of what they think is radical change is way too slow. And they are talking, people are looking at them and if they wanna maintain their stock price, which is what you're paying the C-suite to do, right? Is, uh, I mean, they have the role in society of providing energy and you know that's obviously extremely important, but how they do it is, um, and, and whether they can, that'll be attractive to investors the way they're suggesting they're gonna do it. Um, that's the responsibility of the management of the company. And I think this past week was a indictment about whether the leadership in those three companies are doing it well enough. Terrific. Well, listen, thank you so much, uh, Amy, for joining us today. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. You're so smart and have such a wealth, uh, a wealth of expertise. Uh, so Amy Meyer Safri is, uh, is on Twitter. You should follow her. And of course, you should have a look at her new book, uh, Energy's Digital Future. Thank you so much, Jeff. Thanks for, for joining us.